that we are talking about transforming curriculum, time-saving strategies for enhanced rigor through alignment. We are very thankful for our partnership with iDesign and they have been wonderful collaborator collaborators on this webinar and we hope that you find this webinar valuable and we'll have more information about how you connect with them toward the end of the presentation. Our speakers today are Leah Davis from iDesign, Brenda Boyd from Quality Matters, Corey Vigner from Augusta University, and Krista Gallen from iDesign as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, have Leah introduce herself and then she'll have the speakers introduce themselves. But before we get to that, I do wanna just welcome you all to WCET. If this is your first event with us, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're happy to have you here. If you're brand new to WCET, um, do check us out online and learn more about our events programs. We have an annual meeting coming up in Long Beach, so make sure that you check that webpage out because I'm sure you all want a reason to go to California. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want to go to Cali? Yeah. <clears throat> all right, my turn? Yeah, go ahead, Leah, thank you. Oh. Hey, hi everyone. Um, so glad you're here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Leah Sharan Davis and I am a vice president of LX Design at iDesign. And um, if you want to, as we're just kind of getting started here, we'd love to know um, who you are, at least, you know, share your name, maybe your role, and also uh, what institution you are at currently. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it to Brenda Boyd to introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Brenda Boyd. I'm Vice President of uh, Program Services at Quality Matters. Um, I have oversight of our professional development and quality assurance departments, and I'm also responsible for updating the Quality Matters rubric you probably heard of. So. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. And then Corey, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Sure. Absolutely. Hello, everybody. My name is Corey Victor, and I'm the AVP for Online Education at Augusta University in Georgia. And I'm really uh, happy to be here, share some of my experiences, um, and um, hope we have a good time together. Excellent, and Krista? Yes, I'm Krista Gallian. I'm Senior Vice President of LX Design and iDesign. Super happy to be here today, um, and looking forward to alignment and time-saving strategies. All right, back to you, Leah. All right. So thank you all for putting some information in the chat. It's really nice to see. We have quite a few different um, types of roles, um, many different types of universities. We've got instructional designers and faculty and um, leaders, um, academic program navigator for workforce equity initiative. I mean, my goodness, that it sounds amazing. Um, so some of these are newer types of titles for my eyes. So I'm very excited to, um, to see that. And, you know, just as a quick overview for today's um, session, um, you know, we want to talk a lot about how we can save time for um, folks in higher education who are focused on um, student success, uh, rigor, effectiveness of curriculum, and a few of the ways that we're going to do that is we're going to focus on some of the foundational alignment practices. Uh, we're going to focus in on course mapping, um, looking at how educational programs can be optimized um, through meeting diverse needs of today's learners. Um, and then thinking about that assessment data, <clears throat> we're always thinking about assessment data in this space. And then also, you know, student success, false, fostering a culture of excellence in terms of ways that students can uh, be measured for learning and, and then how can they apply it in their world. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Brenda for her part of her presentation. So um, I am here to talk about the idea of alignment and introduce this concept to you. It is um, an underlying uh, part of the Quality Matters rubric. The Higher Education Quality Matters rubric has 44 specific review standards and six of them are about alignment. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But the way that Quality Matters defines alignment is that it, it is critical course elements working together to ensure that learners um, achieve those desired learning outcomes. And there's a visual here on the slide that I developed that is really about like 
keeping that student learning on the tracks um, where you're going to be able to see like the train tracks have the learning objectives on one track, your assessments on the other track, those have to be in alignment. Um, and you can see on this slide that there are railroad ties labeled instructional materials, learning activities and technology. And those are the pieces that hold it all together and support that connection between the learning objectives and the assessments within a course. So we can move to the next slide. There are, as I mentioned, there are six specific review standards in the QM rubric. And these are the ones that are focused on alignment. The 2.1 is all about the course level learning objectives, describing outcomes that are measurable. And 2.2 is about the module level learning objectives, describing outcomes that are measurable that are also consistent with the course level learning objective. And 3.1 is about the assessment actually measuring the learning objectives. Um, and 4.1 is that support. If you think back to the image, that's the first one of the first railroad ties. So we don't evaluate the quality of the content per se, except through the lens of will it help the learners meet the learning objectives. Instructional materials may include things like videos or textbooks or ebooks or OER, all of those things. Um, and then 5.1 looks at the learning activities that help the learners achieve the state of learning objectives. And that means do they have opportunities to practice so that when they, um, you know, they have those opportunities to fail and learn from their mistakes when they are um, in, your, in the course. And then 6.1 addresses the tools that, and technologies that are used in the course are they selected correctly to support those achievement of the learning objectives? So we can see this as an example in action on the next slide, which is an example that um, Amy Grinswich from Kent State University graciously provided to us. Um, this is an this one is um, we we asked for a program outcome um, to align with as well because as we know all of courses. Um, are funneling up to some kind of a program outcome. Um, and there is a mapping that happens that I believe Chris is gonna talk about and as well as Corey in just a moment. But this in this example, we can focus then on program outcome number five, which is the fourth bullet on the slide, which is around um, recognize ethical business dilemmas and use ethical decision-making to resolve the dilemma. So this is one of four program outcomes that this course uh, uh, maps to. And we're sharing those other three to show the rest of that mapping. So a course level learning objective here is experience ethical and, and legal decision-making dilemmas faced in various managerial settings. So is it measurable? And um, it may be, it, we need to take get more information and look at our module level objectives. So let's take a look at the next slide. Um, because there is a caveat that even if a course level learning objective isn't measurable, the module level objective should be measurable and at least map and you know go back up to that course level learning objective. So here we see this is a um, this is a typical alignment map that you may create for a course. Um, on the left hand side in the first column we have the module numbers and then the module learning outcomes for that particular module. Um, the next column includes the assessments and learning activities, and then the instructional materials, as well as the course tools. So you can see here that all the pieces that are on that initial image are the headings of this, um, of this alignment map. And this is a great way to map out what you're doing. And this is typically how most um, instructional designers work and faculty work to ensure the alignment of their course can also be a great artifact to help with um, accreditation. So here we can see that there are learning objectives that have assignments and assessments that map to them with materials and there's a tool that it can be used with. So all of the pieces are here and this is just one little snapshot of what it takes um, for a whole course and, and a whole program, there could be multiple courses that are rolling up into those program outcomes. So this is one example of what we're talking about today, which is um, you know, really thinking about that idea of alignment. 
So over to Krista. Yeah. So as you can see, quality alignment, especially as you go from the course to the program level, can get pretty complicated and take a lot of time. So at iDesign, what we've done is we've developed a software called Align to take that time and frustration away from that alignment and accreditation and looking at that program view level and let you do what you do best, which is noticing patterns and creating solutions for those patterns. So what rigor is, is alignment. So right here, we're looking at um, the workload across courses. Where is the time being spent? And compare that time across courses because we know where the time spent is where we want the time spent towards those learning objectives. You heard Brenda mention program learning outcomes, for example. So in this alignment grid, this is generated for you. So you've created all those alignments, those activities, and now you can start to see across a program, how are those PLOs attached and evidenced through those activities? So this is generated for you, so you don't need to go in and create another Excel document of all of the alignment across your program. So that reduces a lot of work. And you're also, uh, through Align, you're able to drill down and get full reports and adjust that data as you see fit. So the ability to take that time away from creating more Excel documents, of tracking where you are in your program, and then trying to find patterns, allows you to just look at this and, and find the patterns yourself in order to create solutions. So with our next slide, one of our partners, UCLA, they leveraged a line to analyze their MHA program across the program outcomes as well as CEF standards. I don't know if any of you are over nursing programs, which this isn't one, but nursing has extensive standards which is almost, I would say, borderline impossible to keep track of across multiple programs as one human being. So having a program where you can start to see patterns, only you as an expert know if the patterns are good or desirable or not as desirable. That's where we've seen the highlights so that that program director can go in and look and see, are these patterns desirable or not? In the next slide, it'll show how once you can start to easily get that information about a program, now you can start to plan with that information. That initial workload analysis is the time being spent in the way that we want to. So rigor doesn't need tons of time. Rigor means alignment. Rigor means efficient use of time. So if there's 300 hours spent when they could be spending 150 in those targeted outcomes, that's where we want students to spend their time. You can also, in the next slide, look at continuous improvement plans. Once you're able to easily get that information about alignment all the way up through a program, and you can easily plan your continuous improvement priorities based on the patterns that you see, based on where you wanna put your effort on workload, on time, on the alignment strengths, on the ev evening out of the where you're teaching across the alignment standards, again, across a whole program or even multiple programs. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Corey who will dive into his experience of looking at alignment at multiple programs. Thank you, Krista. So um, again, my name is Corey Victor, and I'm the AVP for online education at Augusta University. Uh, I started a, I started working here a little over two years ago, and um, I was brought on to help with um, a certain couple of key uh, goals that the university has. The first is to get us to 16,000 students by 2030. And the second is to build 25 uh, really online programs. Um, and um, uh, needless to say, the past two years, it's been a lot of work. Um, a lot of these programs um, are, uh, well, most of them are graduate programs. Uh, very few will be undergraduate programs, but uh, of the, right now we're about 12,000 students and um, we're expected to, um, you know, um, provide a good number of those 16,000 students that, that we need to get, there, get to. Uh, after a year, 
we're upwards of a little over 700 students um, and we're at about six programs. Um, so we're making really great progress and we're doing a, a lot of great work. And um, go to the next slide. And, and I think a lot of that uh, early success that we've had with about 92% retention rate has a lot to do with our partnership with, with iDesign. When I first started at, at AU, I was given a year to get three programs up fully and fully running. And, and prior to AU, Augusta University rather, um, I pretty much just did instructional design with my own teams. Um, I, I, I would hire my own instructional designers and I would create my own processes. And, uh, but I certainly had more time uh, to work with than a year. I mean, I had a year to get everything up and running. And um, my boss uh, said to me, you know, I've been doing some research and I think we need to work with iDesign. I said, nah, you're crazy. I could do it myself. He said, Corey, you can't do it yourself. There's just no way. And um, he was right and I was wrong. Um, I was really wrong. And in, in a year or even less than a year, we went through all everything that you're, you know, most of what you're looking at here, all these different phases um, with their wonderful team of, you know, I worked with a really few dozen people, right, Leah? I mean, there were a lot of people that really touched um, really building us um, to be able to be in a situation where we could start um, really um, for, for really August 2023. Keep in mind, I started August 2022. And um, um, we really worked a lot in, in essentially building uh, an online university in, in less than, than a year. And part of that was um, something that they were talking to me about. Part of the attraction that I saw was something that I really couldn't do myself um, and was always a hole in the programs that I've created in the past. And that's what really what, what Krista was saying with Align. Um, so let's go to the next slide. But, but before we, we before we get to that, these are some of the things that that they they helped me with. It wasn't just a matter of building the courses. Yes, they had great instructional designers that worked with our faculty building, I think it was 35 courses you know we, we, we've completed together. Um, I mean three three programs. but it was more than that. it was it was orientations and um, I'm just looking here all sorts of help to build our navigation within within D2L. I mean we work very collaboratively together. Um, and, and we're, we're experiencing again, again, a great deal of success, but it was something that, that was a line again, which Krista went over was something we were working on really in the background that, that I wasn't fully, um, I knew we were doing it. I, 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 I watched it, you know, almost from afar because I was really in the, in the operational sense of how are we going to get this off the ground? But in the background, while we were developing these courses, they were taking all of the alignments from the course maps that were created and they were pumping it into this system. And now that, you know, our courses are done, I'm able to really step forward and, and, and really analyze what, what's happening in these programs. In the past, I've developed programs, but really what I was developing were courses. And I was hoping that they sort of fit together, but I wasn't sure that they did. I knew we were aligning our, um, our course objectives to the program objectives and to the whatever accreditation, but I really wasn't sure fully. And maybe there were, there were spreadsheets we were using, but there wasn't anything really visual that showed me where, where all the holes were or, or what are we doing too much? What are we paying too much attention to, but really not at all. But now that we've developed really three programs and, you know, and a couple of them have accreditation uh, implications like uh, uh, MPH, um, I, I think that, that I think it was was Chris or Leah. I think it was Chris that said CEPH. Or maybe, maybe it was Leah. I'm not sure, but but that's some some heavy duty stuff, right? And then we've got an education program. We're bring we're, we've started uh, an MPA program. Um, you know, these all have uh, accreditation implications. So we've really got to show people that we haven't just created disjointed courses, but we've actually created a program, and we need a tool to be able to show us what that data is, as well as to provide the faculty and the and the leadership of those programs so that they can work on continuous improvement. And um, and, and I think that uh, I think that this this tool does that. You can go to the next slide.
Well, I mean, I know it's hard to see. I I, I I know that it's a little bit small on my end. Maybe it's bigger on other people's ends. But but I, I think what you're looking at really is really all of the courses that we've developed in a particular program and 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 then standards. So in one view, you're able to see where are these standards being met in what program. And when you really dive into it and you really look very closely, um, like, like I have, you'll see some some courses aren't really, uh, they're not really addressing, you know, some of the, the, the accreditation standards very much at all. Um, I mean, I've some, seen some, some courses where it's, you know, very sparse. I mean, the amount of time they're spending on it is very, very few, uh, very few amount of minutes or hours or, or whatever. Um, and, and that needs to be addressed. The, the, there's an opportunity here when you look at the overview. And I think Chris has showed you, you can really drill down. But when you look at, you know, just the big picture, um, I think that it's a very powerful thing to see, you know, are we hitting everything we're supposed to be hitting? Are we covering it too much? Are we not covering it enough? And I think that there's an information that can be provided back to the faculty who develop these courses and the, and the, and, and the deans and associate deans to say, I think, you know, there's something here for you to look at. We may or may not have a problem here. Faculty were developing these courses in really in isolation from each other. I mean, we hope that they'll work in teams and consult with each other, but they're really working alone with instructional designers. But now we can really get the conversations going, and now we can move into the land of continuous improvement. And we want to get to a point so that when a credit, uh, first of all, I mean, we want to make sure that the courses are really good and the students meet the outcomes and stuff like that. But really, when the accreditation agencies show up, you want to be able to say, look, Look at what we have, and you want to be able to drill down to exactly where where everything's being covered, and and get right into the courses, and and find your artifacts. That you, um, it, it's a really very very. I'm starting to see it's a really very powerful tool um, that that we're really just starting to um, understand that we are developing a program again. And I can't say this enough because it, for me, I always thought I was developing programs, you know, my entire career, but maybe not so in theory. I mean, people were signing up for programs, but what we were developing were, were, were courses um, that were probably connected on some level, but now I know. I could see it visually. Um, you go to the next slide. Yeah, I think this is more of the same, but I but I think it shows time, right? How much, how, right? Is that correct? Or no, or does it show how many times of, something's covered? Number of alignments. Yeah, number of than, alignments. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, and you could see when numbers are really huge and when numbers are really like very small, you know, that maybe we're covering something a little bit too much or something not at all um, or, or, or very few. Um, again, it starts to make that connection um, that, that we desperately need. So, I mean, we have, we have, we have more to learn. Um, I, I think it's a great opportunity, again, to really just partner with the academic programs and to keep the conversations going. I think it adds a lot more validity to what we do in the instructional design world. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, like we could develop our own our online courses ourselves. Why do we need you? And this is this is this is a reason. This is really added value, I think. Things that they might not be able to do uh, themselves um, with this kind of tool. So thank you. That's what I have. All right. So um Basically, what we've shown you today is really focused on rigor through alignment and, and our ideas about how to save time through that alignment, which then pays off into accreditation time savings as well. So more efficient, less time. So you've all likely experienced how much work that can be. And one of the tools through Align having some amazing time saving strategies, not just saving time, but saving time, but then also being able to do more and see more and be do more of what you do best, which is that creative problem solving. So Align brings the curriculum into one location. So if you're thinking about not just one program, but how do you find and share those pieces between programs, right? So getting your information into a system can really help that type of creativity as well. Also as standards evolve and change. So for example, I'm sure many of you have had one standard set 
or one outcome set, for example, the nursing essentials, evolve into another nursing set or another standard set that you now need to adopt. That can feel overwhelming. But with a tool you can then do, if some of you have done crosswalks before, essentially crosswalks from one standard to the next, then tr in the line trickles down to all of the assignments that you've done before. So migrating to new standard sets now makes it easy to, within an instant, be able to see how all of your work actually aligns to the new standard set. So the other thing that we're really excited about that also really saves a lot of time is the AI mapping assistant. It just came out, I saw it last week. It's very exciting. So essentially a lot of mapping is about seeing similar ideas between an activity, between a learning objective and between another activity and another learning objective. So having AI help you bring those to the forefront and then you get to be the decider. Do you accept that mapping? Do you not? So you're still the arbiter of what is correct and the expert, but man, that's, that thing has saved so much time just in and of itself, that AI mapping assistant. So I hope you all get a chance to see that. Um, so again, uh, I hope uh, on the lower right-hand corner, there's a code that you can scan to go ahead and book a demo because I think there's a lot to offer for time savings, for rigor, for alignment, um, to be able to dive in and ask those questions yourself, all about what I call the fiddly bits, all the things that you're curious about. All right, I think, Leo, is it time for Q&A? Yes, indeed it is. So there's a first question. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna read it, but I'm also gonna type it in the, the main chat for everyone. So Christopher Nelson asks, for institutions that have an engage in outcomes assessment at the course program, core gen and institutional levels, what does comprehensive alignment look like? Since certain CLO might feed into PLO, COs and ILOs, mm -hmm. some or all of the above. So Crystal, yes. for you, yeah. So, okay. So how Align works is, remember Brenda's um, course, uh, course alignment grid that she showed her course map. So you map the activities to your lowest level. So typically that's like a module level objective. Some say enabling learning objectives. You might say skill. So whatever you're aligning to, there's something where your activity maps to that. And then after that point, it's a standard or an outcome mapped to another standard or outcome. And so our platform supports that. So you would map your CLOs to your PLOs, your PLOs to your ILOs, maybe your CLOs to another professional standard set like the nursing essentials or the CEF standards. And what that does is anytime you bring on a new standard set, you can align the CLOs to that and that will all trickle down to your assignments. So you don't have to go back all the way to mapping to every single assignment because um, it inherits those alignments. Hopefully that made sense. Let us know if there's any follow-up questions. Yeah, on that. please follow up. Yep. And then there's, there is another question from Matt Muir, if I'm saying his last name properly. And that is, how many person hours do you think this tool has saved you as an, on an estimate? Um, has yeah. or potentially could? I think that's a good one for Corey. I figured. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's hard for me to, to answer that question directly because we, we partnered with iDesign and, and they helped. But I can tell you from years of doing this kind of stuff, um, what Align does is it just, um, I don't know, it's um, it, maybe it's, it's sort of like you put it to the back burner, like you know it's important. You have to do the work of really, you know, aligning everything and being able to see it. And But you're just so busy. You just you, you just got to pump out these classes and get it done. And you're doing the work and, and the information, it's in documents somewhere. Uh, but you never really take it all the way to to creating something that you need until you need it, right? And then you need it and you need it fast. What I like about this is you can create a process where you're you're really just intaking the information and then 
and then through all sorts of all sorts of processes that were developed, sort of batch load the information up into the system, and then it it just sort of it takes care of itself for you. So I really don't see a great deal of manual work that has to be done. Of course, I didn't do the manual work, but but there are processes in, that run in the background that take the information and then upload it into the system. So the potential there is to is to do the is to do the work as you're doing the developing, not wait till the last minute and um, and in the end save yourself a lot of time and and use it way before you actually really need it. Good answer, Corey. All right. All right. Well, those were the two questions that were um, that were added to this so far. Does anyone have any other I questions? I see one more in the chat. So does this require staff at the program to review the alignments at the most basic level each year or semester? For example, a review of the syllabus for any changes to activity assignment yeah. assessment for each I, modular course. I think so. I mean, I think that course, what I'm noticing is that is okay. So we work with, with iDesign to build our courses. Um, but then you teach the courses the first time and the courses, they never turn out exactly the way you think they're going to turn out. Right. So when you put it into play, it's different than when it, when it's in your head. And then you want to go back and you want to make adjustments. So, so a line allows you, so you've got to go back to the original maps and you've got to make changes, but then you've also got to make changes, the, the corresponding changes in, in a line. So, um, it is it is it is helpful with continuous improvement. Um, that's that's for sure. I don't know if I answered the question. Um, I think I lost the question when more of the uh, the uh, the questions kept popping up on I the think, screen. I think you got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that I think that really just depends on what your continuous improvement sort of model processes, yeah. processes internally, and 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 that could be different, right, based on whether you're in a centralized unit within the with the institution, or if you're somebody who works at more of the program or departmental level. And so, um, I think it just gives this, you know, the ability to, like I think Corey said, to see things that you just wouldn't see hmm. that are in documents, etc., or if you have of courses that are being changed by faculty, you know, as they go along and teach the course, et cetera, and then sort of, you know, matching matching the pieces together in terms of what you're actually submitting for accreditation and different types of reporting structures. But this has to become part of the process, right? You just can't update the courses. You've got to update this as well, which, which isn't hard, but you've got to make sure that what's in there, which you may be showing to accreditation agencies at some point, reflects reality. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, um, we have, uh, are any other questions? I see it's a little chatting going on, so I don't- There's, you... there's a few more in the Q&A there, Leah. Oh, great. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, um, let's see here. For Corey, where does this initiative live in your institution? Well, it lives within my area. And um, uh, we're, we're, we are a separate unit. Um, AU Online is, um, you know, we're service to the- um, to the programs that are with us. Not all online programs are with AU Online. Um, you have to fit a certain criteria um, that we have to be part of um, our unit. Um, and this is something that we see really as, as value added, right? It, what, you know, being part of AU Online is really a choice. Like with that comes all sorts of marketing support. It comes with a certain instructional design uh, support, it comes with student support. Um, but I think this is really, I think this is one of the, this is one of the why, why should we join you? Well, because we can help you to organize everything, uh, make sure that everything's covered um, and be able to show people um, really what you're doing and what we're doing and what we're all about. 
So, so this fits in nicely into our, um, I guess, our, our portfolio of, of, again, of why. Why should they become part of us? Because they, they may not be able to do it on their own or they wouldn't think to do it on their own or have the manpower to do it on their own. And since we're already working with developing the courses, this is just a natural fit. Yep. And so Janet Williams asks, well, first she makes a statement, money is always a critical part of the decision. And what funding sources are typically used for this type of tool? So Corey, do you want to start with that first? And then Well, we, we had a car wash <laughs> and, and a fundraiser, and we're going to be open, you know, using a snack stand later at a football game. Now we 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 were able to, we're we're actually fortunate in that we're at, we're we're very well funded. You know, it goes back to the overall goals of, of the university that I I put forth, you know, we're part of this major uh, 16,000 by 30 by uh, by 30. Um, you know, we are we have become a, a major initiative. And with that came the appropriate funding. So I, I think that you would have to make an argument to your to your leadership as to why this is important. And I, 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 I to me, anyway, it makes so much sense with those programs that have accreditation. Um you know, it's the why, because everybody feels that pain, you know, that last minute scramble, you know, what are we going to pull together? And and we, sometimes we feel like frauds along the way. I mean, we have it, but we've got to really dig down deep into the LMS and find things. And um, it, it just, I think this is a really good argument uh, for this. And, you know, I mean, I'll leave, I'll leave the money stuff up to the money people, but I just see that it, it's valuable and that it helps you to put your head on the pillow, knowing if they were to show up, you know, you, you've got answers. You know exactly where to go and what to say. Yes. And I, I would just say from, from my experience, um, it could be different pockets of the university that would find yeah. value and support the tool and the programs across, you know. It, it, it's not a hard sell. Because everybody, everybody can visualize, you know, what's happening here, and I, I certainly think, you know, what 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 Chris just showed and, and what I showed, um, it's really that peace of mind, right? It really is, and knowing that you're 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 really doing the right thing by the students and the university, everybody's got their backs protected here, so. All right, um, just wonder, just double check in, check check. In. I saw. Question from Justina um, about what to do with the assessment data after they analyze and interpret. So, so there's there's the evaluation and assessment of the program, right? Where you're looking at the program inside of something like a line, for example. But a lot of what people want to get to. So you've got your when you're looking at program reviews, you've got your indirect data, which is how students think they're accomplishing those PLOs. So what's nice is you can take your different data points. You've got your nice, rigorous, like the things we showed you in a line. Let's say you send out surveys to students to get your indirect assessment data back about how much students think that they're accomplishing in that program, how well they learned those PLOs. And those questions should align to those program learning outcomes. So now you can actually align the questions with, with align, <laughs> align the questions to that system say, okay, these, these students felt that PLO two, they just didn't feel like they really got that out of this program. You can now track all the way back and see which assignments, which courses, what activities they're doing in PLO2 and which are not. So you've got the pathway back to go from student survey data all the way back for your indirect assessment, but then for direct, you've got your, your um, student outcomes in your learning management system, for example. They are performing in assignments. Those assignments are actually in a line. So you could a little bit of elbow grease and good data, like make sure it's nice and clean. You can actually now take this LMS data and the aligned data and say, okay, how well are the students actually achieving these objectives? All the way up to the PLOs. So now you've got your direct 
assessment data, right? Without going, oh gosh, how, how do we get this direct assessment data out? It takes a little bit of data discipline, but, but the fact that it's doable now that you've got a place that can, that you can put different data sources together to tell a story and then map a path for a variety of different ways. So um, hopefully that gives, makes your brain kind of pop and go, oh, wow, we could do a lot with this information. Yeah, mm-hmm, nice. I like how you said that, Vernon. A repository of your assessment story. Okay. Any other questions coming to mind? Okay, here's another question. Any thoughts on partnering with post-completion partners, employee or transfer to double check if these outcomes are actually being met? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes. I, I think there's... <laughs> I think that's always one of the big questions is um, institutions struggle with those follow-up surveys. I mean, Corey could probably speak to this more, but just based on the partnerships that we have, um, getting the information and if they were able to get direct assessment, not just indirect through some way, that would be pretty valuable. Corey, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm with you. I mean, it is a good question. Um, you know, when you bring the people outside, you know, uh, you know, is, is our curriculum doing what it's supposed to be doing? Um, but mm -hmm. um, I think this helps provide information if we're on the right track, you mm -hmm. know, but 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 ultimately, you know, it will be good information to have. And it can be shared. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it just it gives another opportunity to have deeper conversation. conversation. That's right. It's conversation, which is, which is all, it's what we want conversation. Yeah. And, and that's a process. Loop. Yes. It's a process. And this is just an important missing piece of that process. You know, that, that this, this covers, a, you know, a, 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 what I thought was a whole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And ideally the partners who are on giving feedback on if they're met would also be on the front end of helping to inform what those standards would be to begin with. Correct. Yeah. Because they could look at it and say, you know, you've got things a little out of whack here, right? You know, you're, yep. you're stressing the wrong things and mm -hmm. spending too much time, but what they really need is this. Right. All right, so I'll wait another minute for any last minute questions um, or any final questions. Well, we can go ahead and move through the other slides and if people have questions, please go ahead and add them. So thank you. So um, I just wanna mention a few things on the WCET side here. We do record our webcasts and we put those on our website. So you can go back to any of our previous webcasts, including the recording of this one. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And again, if you're new to WCET, we are the leader in the practice policy and advocacy of digital learning in higher education. And on our website, you'll see we have areas for community equity policy and practice. And there's wonderful resources available there. Most of them are free and open. And we have... Lots coming up here at WCET. We have a, another um, webcast on the, on September 27th. Actually, that's the WCET Closer Conversation. Those are unrecorded, just facilitated conversations for members. And then on October 22nd, we have a free and open webinar, Strategy, Vision, and Academic Affairs, a Framework for Successful Online Learning. We also want to thank all of our partners that help make the work here at WCET possible. We really rely on these partners to help uh, support the work and underwrite m most of what we do here at WCET. And iDesign is a great partner. We're very grateful for all the work that you've collaborated with us on over the years.
And lastly, we have an amazing group of supporting members that invest at a higher level because they truly believe in the work that we're doing. So shout out to these partners here. And I believe that concludes. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. Krista, Leah, Corey, Brenda, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and um, sharing a line with our membership. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you very much for being here. Take care all.